This video has been made possible by the people that support me over at Patreon. Literally, you paid for my time to be able to make this video. If you would like to be able to support me in that way as well, just follow the link in the description below. Well, hey there, idiots. Welcome back to Observe. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the initial interrogation footage of Scott Peterson the very day that Lacey, his wife, and his unborn son, Connor, were reported missing. While this is the third video that I have done on Scott Peterson, I was able to prepare for this one far better than I was the other two. I was able to take time to be able to pour over hours more footage and to read through all of the court documents that were available to the public as well. And this helped inform me even further as to the aspects of this case that were more unknown to me earlier on. To catch everybody up to speed as to who Scott Peterson is and what he did and why he is where he is now, let's go ahead and dive into yet a little bit better of a backstory. So Scott Peterson, who was in his late 20s, was married to Lacey Peterson, who was in her mid-20s, and they were set to have a son named Connor. Lacey was eight months pregnant at the time of all of the incidents that will be unfolding here soon. Now, a little bit about Scott growing up. He was apparently, according to his family, very, very kind, and to quote his father, almost unbelievably kind. Which I find suspicious because I have yet to meet a child who is completely and unbelievably kind. That being said, that is something that I was taking into consideration with this read. Along with that, people say that he was a very controlled and composed person at most times, easy to get along with, and rarely confrontational. Lacey was a very outgoing, bubbly, happy personality, also very confident in who she was as a person. Both of them seemed to be an excellent couple. They got married, tried to have a child for three years, and then finally received a positive pregnancy test back. Fast forward eight months, and we start seeing a little bit of unhappiness unfold. First, Scott is having an affair. He is seeing a girl named Amber Fry, who is young in and of herself, and has a child who is less than two years old. He, however, does not tell Amber that he is married, and he does not tell Lacey that he is seeing Amber until a friend finds out and gives him an ultimatum. Then he decides that he has to go and tell Lacey. According to his interviews, he says that Lacey took it rather well, which I found suspicious, and his body language also said was suspicious, but he did not tell Amber. Later on, Amber found out and went forward quite promptly during this entire explosion of media coverage of Lacey's disappearance. She went forward and said that she had been his girlfriend and had been under the impression that he had no other women in his life. This would seem abnormal if it weren't for the fact that he had done this before outside of his marriage with Lacey, with other girls as well, who have also come forward on record. So he has a repeat history of having affairs or cheating on the women that he was with. So needless to say, he tells Lacey that he's having an affair and things start to go fairly far south. In that time, he also buys a boat secretly. He also starts researching at that same time on Google how certain currents and water flows occur in the San Francisco Bay area, and he says that it is in regards to fishing. Speaking of fishing, he also has a history of searching for sturgeon primarily and a few other types of fish. So he chalked all of his search history up and the purchasing of a boat for wanting to go fishing. This comes in play later on. Let's fast forward to the 24th. Remember, Scott has told Lacey that he's having an affair, and he says that Lacey's pretty okay with it. Upset, but pretty okay with it. I didn't buy that, and I still don't buy that. The 24th, Christmas Eve, is supposed to be both busy in the evening, relaxed in the first half of the day, according to Scott. So he said that Christmas Eve evening, they were supposed to go and celebrate with Lacey's family. And the day before that was spent on preparation. However, he also claimed that most of the preparation had already taken place. So he had the morning section free. 
And he says they get up at a certain time, they watch a show, a specific show, and then he heads out anywhere between 9.30 and 10.30 to go fishing. What's interesting about this is that he had told a neighbor that he had gone golfing. Needlessly lied about it, nobody's sure why. I believe it is a pattern. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. So he says that he goes fishing, leaving his eight month pregnant wife at home by herself to more or less prep for the evening herself and have some quiet time. Well, it is said that Lacey was supposed to go walking the dog during this time. And while Scott is fishing, something apparently happens. According to Scott, he had tried to call Lacey multiple times while out fishing and received no response. And when he got home, he found not only was the car there, the keys were there, and her normal belongings were in the house. To make things more strange, the back door was unlocked, and the dog was in the backyard with the leash still on. It's very curious. So instead of calling friends and family, he decides that he needs to wash his clothes that he, and I quote said, were dirty from fishing, to eat some pizza, and to relax for a bit before calling Lacey's mom and says that right off the bat, she is missing. He doesn't check where she's at. He doesn't ask if the mom has heard from Lacey. He simply jumps to the conclusion that she is missing. She is not in the house, ergo she is missing. Now, needless to say, the parents are a little bit more concerned about this than Scott seems to be, so they are the ones who call 911 and alert the police. All during this time, Scott has a cool, casual, unbothered demeanor. As the neighborhood and police explode into an activity of trying to track down Lacey, Scott maintains this detached, uninterested, unconcerned demeanor, and it starts to alert people. People start finding it as strange, understandably so. So he is asked in that very night, the night of the 24th of December, to go into the police quarters to be able to have a further interview to clarify things and maybe remember things you didn't before. Today, I'm going to be analyzing part of that footage, the footage of the initial interrogation that was held on Scott Peterson the night that his wife and unborn son reportedly went missing. We're going to be talking about the nonverbal aspects of it, and then I will also continue talking about the case as things continue. This was a very, very interesting case and extremely frustrating on many, many levels, and you'll get to see why. So I am going to talk real quick here as the investigator and interrogator is coming into the room. I'm going to talk a little bit about Scott's body language that he's presenting here and some of the limitations of this footage and what I am trying to carry out today. First, his body language seems pretty relaxed. He doesn't seem fidgety. He doesn't seem antsy. He's simply looking through some documents or pictures here on the table. Along with that, he's leaning forward, his hands are out of his pockets, and all of this is just indicating that he's relaxed and involved in what is going on. Now, speaking on the footage itself, as you can see, as per always, the quality is next to nothing. It's extremely difficult to see any details, let alone the minute movements of the face that I would like to be able to see. So today's read is going to be specifically centered around looking at the entire case and then also trying to pay attention as best as possible to Scott's entire body movements, his broad gestures, his posturing, his tone, things that we can hear and see clearly enough. However, it is still very very limited, and this was one of the frustrations right off the bat, is that I cannot see his face very clearly. You can sometimes see general broad expressions, but as far as any micro or mini expressions, it is absolutely impossible to see. Let's keep watching. Pretty much got all I'm going to do. Let's just go over what we, what we already talked about so I can make some notes. Let's 
see if you remember something that you don't, maybe you don't know you remember. So right off the bat, something that I am noting is the distancing and blocking that Scott is immediately doing. Now this can be chalked up to that's how he most comfortably sits. Many people can relate to the sitting back, crossing the legs as a comfortable position, especially if you're in for something for a long haul, be it a movie, or in this case, an interrogation. But he does immediately set back into that when the investigator comes in. This is an odd point to do that, not only because he could have been doing that before while looking through the documents or pictures that he had, but also because it's at the instance that the person who could be threatening his innocence or his story comes into the room. So this is something that I immediately made note of in Scott's behavior. Now speaking on Scott's baseline. I feel like I have a very accurate idea of what Scott's baseline is and one of his tells of stress that repeatedly pops up throughout all of the footage is an increase in pitch and an increase in the fragility of his tone. He gets that froggy, croaky, fried sound to his voice and then you will see that come up multiple times throughout this story but all in all, already, I'm not a huge fan of this, but there's nothing that really sets me off in any direction or another. So, today, just tell me about the morning. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know what time I got up. Probably, uh, Lacey got up and went and, um, Soon had she had some chill for breakfast. He's right. She wakes up, otherwise she gets sick, which is great. So you can hear the timber, the tone of his voice. It's fairly projected, it's fairly casual, there's not a lot of strain. Now, in normal circumstances, this could be seen as pretty okay, and that's how I went into the previous interrogations. However, after considering the broader picture of things, I find this odd. Not only because it's very out of place for the intensity of the situation, you can't see the clock here, but it is just at midnight. So he would be tired and he would likely be stressed after a long day of not knowing where his pregnant wife is, which he said himself he had a glorious relationship with. That does not line up with his behavior. Now, here's an issue that I found in this case largely is that there is no concrete evidence either direction. There's no concrete evidence for his innocence, and unfortunately, there's no concrete evidence for his guilt. There is a massive boatload of circumstantial evidence for his guilt, and then there are some pretty scrambling facts for his innocence. So this was something that I had to churn through quite regularly in my studies during this, is trying to figure out what was evidence, what wasn't evidence, what was admissible, and what wasn't admissible. And I can assure you, you don't need to go and read through the hundreds of pages of court documents because you will be bored out of your mind. Needless to say, right off the bat, I want to make something very clear. There was no concrete evidence of his guilt. It was all circumstantial. But the defenses, his side, Scott's side, their only goal was not to prove his innocence, but just to make it to where he was not seen as guilty beyond reasonable doubt. That was their only goal. And right off the bat for me, that's a red flag. If it's not to prove your innocence, and it's just to prove with a, beyond a reasonable doubt that he could be guilty, that is usually a sign of guilt. But let's continue watching his body language. Uh, I laid around in bed longer and I got up at uh, 8 o'clock probably or so. Uh, showered. And, um, we were watching her favorite show, Martha Stewart. Watched a little bit of that. This is an interesting detail. If you're recounting your day and you're telling somebody that you were doing your morning routine, you say you got up, you showered, blah, 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 then do you say that you watched a specific show or do you just say, yeah, we watched some TV, we did dot, dot, dot. This is an interesting verbal detail that he adds into the story. It's very specific. We watched her favorite show, Martha Stewart. My question is, why would he admit that? Why would he present that so clearly and so upfront unless he needed it to be there. 
This is important and I'll talk more about it as things go on, but I really want to try to focus on what we can from his body language and then consider the rest of the evidence in combination with that. You know what's holding you remember what part you saw? I mean, I don't know what hit him. Well, it could be the old title. Okay, if he's a substore, they're talking about what to do with the ring. This is an important detail. And I don't think that he's lying here. In fact, I know that he's not lying here because, sure enough, they went and they researched what was on TV that day. Martha Stewart was on TV that day. And, according to Scott, it was Lacey's favorite show. Now, the defense claimed, why on earth would that be on if Lacey wasn't alive? Say, perhaps, Scott had already done the deed and Lacey wasn't alive. Why would that show be on and why would he know? Well, it's interesting. If he were used to, perhaps, covering his tracks as somebody who has been shown to be not only a pathological liar, but also a serial adulterer would be used to, he would know that he would have to have some form of evidence for him having watched that show. So if he turned that show on intentionally, one, if it was Lacey's favorite show, he would know when it would come on. It comes on regularly scheduled. So if it came on at its regular time, he could turn it on, pick up a few details, and then that would more or less seal his alibi that he had been watching that show with Lacey. It would be a very easy, simplistic setup to imply his innocence in a situation. And I feel like this is the case in this. He specifically mentions Martha Stewart because he intentionally placed that detail into his story. Let's keep watching. And I, I can't remember, your house, you had the, the converted garage area as a TV room light? Yeah. Is that where you were then? Okay, did you eat any breakfast? Yeah, the whole cereal. Okay, and then, uh, Something else that I want to note, remember how I mentioned that one of his tells is his tone. And what I want to note is that all of this so far has been fairly evident. It hasn't had any of those tells that he normally portrays where it becomes more fragile or it raises or he talks more softly. It's all being pretty much consistent. So during this point of the interrogation, I don't necessarily believe that he's telling a lie. If he is telling a lie, he's mixing it with enough truth that it makes it difficult to detect, especially somebody in my position just trying to rely on a horrible video with horrible audio to see if there's any deception. But that is something that's important to note is that during this part, he's not showing his regular tell. Let's keep watching to see if it shows up. Um, when did you realize you were going to go fishing? Oh, I that was a morning decision. It's either, oh, it was a morning decision. So it's like golf at the club or... Real quick on his storyline, he maintains the storyline of he was making a decision that morning, whether he was going to go golfing or whether he was going to go fishing. However, he told multiple different people, multiple different stories, which was one of the indicators that I picked up on in him being a pathological liar. Pathological liars will oftentimes needlessly lie about needless information. There's no reason for him to lie about it, but he does. And this pops up often throughout his life from what I was able to gather from my research. Um, she's going to finish cleaning the house, like I said, she's going to have to finish the um, Take the dog for a walk, and then she's going to the store and buy for the Christmas morning breakfast for him. And that was going to be a involved prep. So that was her afternoon, she's prepping the breakfast, and she's going to make gingerbread cookies for her so you can hear just lightly a little bit of that pitch change in his tone. Just a little bit. It's very, very soft and it's very, very minute. But it is important to note that it's starting to happen when he's re recollecting what she was going to do. And the reason for that could be, quite literally, that he knew she was never going to do said things. 
This isn't guaranteed. This is all still just surmising based off of what I have seen before. Fukushima the tile on the entryway area. The entry of the front door or the entry of the room that you converted? Uh, when I felt the, um, well, not the front door, but that back door that we came in. Right, where the mop was outside of it? No. no, no. Oh, where you, oh, where your dogs weren't out to your well, backyard? Well, okay, we have the converted garage, yeah. right? Then you have the kitchen, yeah. then you have a room with two chairs in it. Right. Uh, yeah, that room. So take note real quick of a few things that's happening with Scott non-verbally. First, his projection and his confidence in his words has spiked back up. He's also using illustrators with his hands. This means that he's more comfortable using illustrators with his hands. And to back that up, it shows up regularly throughout the rest of his interviews. Here, however, he keeps his hands mostly securely crammed into his pockets. This is not a good nonverbal display of openness. Immediately, this will unsettle anybody, even if they don't quite realize why they're unsettled. So this interrogator absolutely felt that, and he's gone on record saying that he felt that Scott was off. He wasn't sure why. This is part of the reason why, because you can see that Scott comfortably illustrates with his hands. However, throughout the rest of the interview, they're very, very much crammed into his pockets. And so when he's talking about something that's not incriminating, that has nothing to incriminate him with, he's just talking about where his wife would mop. And he's talking about the spaces, he's pointing on the table for a map layout, so he's talking visually, and he's saying so confidently without any ums, stutters, or any pitch changes. These are all important aspects of Scott's nonverbal communication that I was able to pick up on during all of my study. So right now, this all seems pretty okay, right? He seems to be very conversational. He's just having a chat. And this would seem okay, except for the conditions that things are occurring in. And we'll get to my feelings on this a little bit more later on in the video. But one of the prosecution's biggest arguments is that Scott seemed off the whole time. They just said that he seemed off. And some psychologists argue that that isn't really a standard. There's not a standard for how you handle trauma, and that's very true. There's not a standard for how you handle trauma. Everybody handles difficult situations like that massively differently. That being said, there are regulations for how microexpressions and body language display themselves in various instances. And in these instances, the body language that Scott is portraying is nothing if not abnormal. He's showing no agitation. He's showing no interest even with what's going on. Everything is completely detached. Now, without being able to see the smaller details of his face, it's going to be hard to be able to decipher whether this is dissociation or something along those lines, or if he's just emotionally detached. If we're considering his history according to family and friends, he is usually composed. That being said, this isn't a usual instance. Most people will have some form of visible negative reaction towards trauma in their lives at some point. At some point throughout years, they will have visible reactions to trauma. And Scott, over 17 years, has never shown an interest in his wife's disappearance emotionally or non-verbally. I can say that with certainty, having combed through every single minute of available footage that I was able to track down from multiple news sources and multiple platforms. He never shows concern for the disappearance of his wife and unborn son. This is an oddity. It is absolutely an oddity. Let's keep watching. How did it, did 
did you move it back after or when you come home or how did you get outside? Yeah. So you put it out there? Mm -hmm. Dog and cat right in. Yeah, she lived in the box that lived in the head. So when you left, do you remember what she was wearing? Uh, black pants. Uh, white long sleeve top. This is an interesting section here. You see, Lacey's remains were later discovered, obviously, as were Connor's, along the Bay Area. But Lacey was not wearing the clothes that Scott claimed she was wearing at the time. Also, during this time, while he's recollecting, his pitch does again change, as does his tone. It grows softer. If you listen to the segment where he's recollecting where she mops, as opposed to what she's wearing, you can hear the absolute, obvious pitch change. This is a red flag to me as a nonverbal analyst as I try to take into consideration all of his nonverbals. That includes his body language, but also includes his pitch and his tone. This is all vitally important for the case, and it's odd that it starts popping up here. Interesting place to take a drink as well. When you lie, oftentimes you can get nervous and your mouth can dry out. Now a pathological liar will be able to control some aspects of their body language. There are some things that are so automatic that we cannot control it. There are some muscle movements and there are some interior body movements that we cannot control regardless of how much we lie. One of those things can be a dry mouth. This doesn't affect everybody and I'm not saying that's happening here. I am however saying that it is absolutely strange that it pops up after his normal tell of a tone slash pitch change and then he already has been verified to be lying about what Lacey was wearing at least when he saw her last. So this is odd. This is where more and more lies seem to be woven into his recollection. Do you notice her jacket? Her jacket was there? Or did she wear it? Like if she went walk, walk in at 10 o'clock or 9.30. She just steals my stuff. She uses your stuff? Yeah. So, you know, mm -hmm. doesn't return to stuff, so I don't I, know. Uh, you know, I don't know. At her or mine, that's what I don't know. How about shoes? Does she have a certain kind of shoes that she walks in or yeah, I used a pair of white tennis shoes. You know, do you remember if they were there or not? Um, the and I looked for them in their normal place, which is outside of our wet bar. Uh -huh. uh, I apologize for the audio quality. I'm having trouble hearing it myself. I did my best to clean this audio up so that you could hear it. The original footage was not only very, very quiet, but it also had a very massively overwhelming electronic feedback and hiss over the top of everything. So what you're hearing is heavily treated audio and it's still just hot, nasty garbage in area. So I apologize for that. But you can hear as he's talking about what his wife would normally wear, his projection comes back up, his confidence comes back up, and he doesn't have any of this uncertain tone to his words that he does in other areas. So in this part, it's obviously not a lie. He is certain that his wife usually wore her white tennis shoes, as she always did. That's not a lie. That's a truth. And part of what makes a convincing lie is being able to interweave your lies with a lot of truth. It's far easier to disguise a lie with a boatload of truths than it is to try to fabricate an entire lie. And that's what I think Scott was able to do during this entire storyline, is he wove truths around his lie. But we'll talk about more why I feel that in a bit. They were not there, but we didn't look further so they could be in the house. They weren't where they normally left. You saw mine where those were. That's where they normally keep. Okay, so then about 9.30 you left. Mm -hmm. And you drove your four-door truck. Um, and you went over to your shop. Right. What did you do over there? Um, I assembled my... Uh, 
Mortiser. You know, Mortiser is uh, a woodworking tool to make tables. Uh, you may be solid on the uh, trailer there. Once again, he has a little bit of a softer tone here when he's saying that he assembled his mortiser. It's a woodworking tool that he did purchase and there are records of him purchasing it. And he also seemed to have put it together at some point before police ever had access to that storage room. However, I do find it odd that his tonal change is in there as well. But now he's about to start explaining what it is and he starts using his hands again and he regains his confidence and everything builds back up when he's talking about something that isn't centered around his wife and unborn son. Before that, I also want to mention that I did do the research for this. I wanted to see if maybe there was a period of time that wasn't accounted for in Scott's recollection of the day. And if he is lying about this, if he did the crime himself and he has concocted this alibi, he did a really good job at it. A really good job at it because every single thing that he's saying lines up time-wise and he has evidence for most sections. There are a few sections that he does not have evidence for. One, he doesn't have any evidence that Lacey and him were actually in the house as casual as watching TV early on because nobody was there. We just have to take his word for it. Along with that, we have no evidence that he did not load a body into his truck, unload it into a boat, and go from there. The only thing that the defense had in that is that he would have had to do that on broad daylight. And who would have done that? Well, to be very frank, with the setup of his shop that he's gone to here, his storage area, his warehouse, whatever you want to call it, it has a roll-up door that you can back up to to be able to hook up a boat into, a trailer, so on and so forth. So the distance that he would have had to move a body to get into, say, a boat would be minimal. Very, very minimal. I'm saying maybe five to six feet to get it from cover to cover. So from the truck bed to the actual warehouse itself and into the boat. That's not a lot of distance, and that's very, very easy to move stuff that amount of distance without taking any notice, especially if you're moving things into a shop that you regularly do manual labor with, nobody's going to bat an eye. But I just wanted to say that so far, timing-wise, his alibi completely checks out, and that's impressive. Check my email. Send one email. And put the boat up and went. Who'd you send the email to? To uh, Eric Van Enis, my boss. The happy holiday email. He left me a message on my phone this morning. Okay, so you assembled. This, uh, what the thing, what was the thing you assembled called? Called a mortiser. For mortise and tendon joints. Where'd you get that? Ordered it online. On uh, eBay auction, actually. Is that for home or for work? It's for home. Uh, home. That's woodwork. Yeah. You do a little bit of that? Okay, the facts you got, you hadn't got it yet. Or did yeah, you? I guess not. I, I'm, I don't know. You can't play. And there he has a little bit of uncertainty in his storyline with the, yeah, I guess not. However, I want to just talk about a frustration I'm having with his body language because it's, a, it's extremely frustrating for me, is that I'm just seeing nothing. It's like reading a blank book. You turn every page, you look as close as you can, and it's blank. Scott is a blank book, and he shouldn't be. In this instance, of all instances, he should not be. He should be giving some signs of care for his wife. The only thing that he's displaying and had always displayed and will always display is a lack of care for Lacey. Because in Scott's mind, it's all about him until he doesn't like it. And he did this on repeat before with other women. He never killed them, but there was never a pregnancy involved. And he did this again and again and again and again. And since he is known to be a pathological liar, he is comfortable with lying. It's extremely frustrating to watch somebody give so few cares about the person he said he had a glorious relationship with. Even if he doesn't emote that way. Because let's just, let's play devil's advocate here for a second. 
Say he doesn't emote that way. Perhaps he's not a very cryy person. Perhaps he's not a very fidgety person. Perhaps he's very, very controlled under pressure and only shows sadness when nobody sees. One, don't buy it. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. Nobody's that controlled over this long of time. He's never broken, ever. He's never visibly broken. And the times that he broke came across as very forced. That makes me uncomfortable non-verbally as well. But say he does maintain composure regularly. He's not a, an emotive person. He doesn't even act like he's interested in trying to track down his wife. Even remotely, even in some of the footage that I was able to track down from the earlier interviews that wasn't usable for this video, even from that footage, there is instances of his phone ringing while a search is occurring for his wife and he doesn't even think to go look at it. He asks if they want him to shut it off. If I were in his shoes, I would be very concerned. If my wife was missing, especially if she was pregnant, eight months pregnant, if she was missing and my phone rang, I would immediately drop everything else. I don't give a flying rat's ass about the interview. I would care about her. He has other priorities. He only cares for himself. This is made prevalent, and this is the storyline that I found the most convincing. But let's keep watching his nonverbal communication. Uh, I remember that, that the boat was arriving right 26, and I wasn't happy about that, but other than that, we may have been when I got back from the hospital, but other than that, I was okay. Okay, then you got your boat up, and then uh, you know about what time you left for that um, gosh, I don't know. Um, I, you know, extrapolate what time I got that deal at noon, is that right? Yeah, that was, uh, no one. And which one is it there? You know, it has two times? Oh, okay. Um, which one's right? Tuesday. Time, 12.54 on December 21st, five months expires. Okay. Expires. So for those of you who are hearing, having trouble hearing it, they're talking about what time he left his shop as opposed to what time he got to the bay itself. So he's saying that he doesn't remember when exactly he left his shop. So what they're doing is they're looking at a ticket stub that he got at the bay area and trying to more or less kind of reverse engineer it to determine when he might have left the shop. This is understandable. I will leave places and not have any idea what time I left a place just because it's not something that you always have to keep track of. So I understand that on Scott's side. And his math does line up. However, there is a possible gap of anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes that are inexplicable. Nobody saw him. Nobody knows what he was doing while at his shop. And it would be plenty of time to perhaps maybe move 150 pounds or so into a boat from the back of a truck. That's all that I'm saying. I'm not saying that is what happened. I'm saying it could have happened there. And nobody would be able to say otherwise besides Scott. Tuesday. Tuesday. Oh, okay. So you got there at 1 o'clock. I got there at 1. Yeah, about 1. And I imagine you took at least an hour and a half. Okay, did you drive straight there? I did. Did you stop for lunch? No. By the bay? No, I'm a bay for sure. You buy no lunch? You didn't eat nothing? You didn't take a lunch? No, I didn't. So I was damn hungry for that pizza when I got home. Okay, so if you got to the, about five minutes to one, you get your boat in, how long do you think you stayed in the water? Uh, felt like an hour and a half or so. Okay, so now we're at the water, right? He's gotten into the water. It's past one o'clock. This is important detail. It's a very important detail and I'll explain to you why actually right now. So Scott's alibi is that he was fishing by himself conveniently in the San Francisco Bay Area for sturgeon as he later said. In this interrogation he says that he doesn't know what he was fishing for which is not a thing by the way. If you're a fisherman you know this you go out with the intention of catching a specific fish be it one fish or a group of fish, you have an idea of what you're fishing for. You also kind of coordinate the bait that you would get to catch said fish. Well, he said he's searching for sturgeon, which for those of you who don't know, sturgeon can often get up to 100 pounds. Not only did Scott not pack the correct poles for that, he also had a boat that was far too small for that, and he had the incorrect bait for that. 
none of that lined up, this would be okay if perhaps he was a novice fisherman like myself. I would have no idea. I would have no idea. One, I wouldn't choose to go and search for a sturgeon if I had never done it before by myself. I would definitely want to go with somebody else. But Scott was an avid fisherman. He had been fishing since he was seven years old. Would often go on fishing trips by himself with other people. Would often be seen fishing. Loved to talk about fishing with his family and friends. In this instance, suddenly he had one, no idea about sturgeon. And then two, he had no idea that this is a terrible time to go fishing. The afternoon, one in the afternoon, is not a good time to go fishing. And a whole group of fishermen kind of took a look at this evidence and they decided 100% certainty that this man did not leave this shore with the intention of catching one of those fish. He was not equipped for it. It all kind of lines up to where perhaps Scott wasn't being a simple happy-go-lucky fisherman on the day of the 24th. There may have been something a lot more sinister happening. Watch or anything, but see if I was getting home at 30. Or two. I don't know, an hour and a half, I guess, probably after it. Did you have a map for that area? or No. Would you just weigh it? So you just, when you got in your boat and you took off, did you go very far? Or? Well, I mean, like a mile from the north, um, found a, like a little island kind of deal there. Mm -hmm. um, island uh, had a bunch of trash on it. I remember a big sign that said no landing. It looked like some broken piers around it. And I just assumed it would be a decent, you know, shallow area. Did you troll? A little bit. All right, so once again, he starts talking again about certain aspects, and he starts illustrating again, and I believe he's telling the truth at this point. Not only do I believe it, but I know he's telling the truth. I know that he went out and saw these things because other people went and retraced what his steps could have been and saw the same things, a beach full of trash and the sign and the island and everything that he's recounting. I believe he actually saw. His nonverbal communication aligns with that. So that is part of the truth that seems to be woven in with these other lies that he's telling. And that's why it's sold so well as truthful to so many people is because it could be seen as such. I'm gonna talk about some of the issues that the case had, that both sides, the defendant and the prosecution, both of them had issues during this case. And I'll talk about those at the end. Let's keep watching this and then we'll just, we'll wrap everything up as per usual. I mean, a lot of a lot of the reason I went was just to get that boat in the water to see, you know, yeah. Okay, so you fish 90 minutes, about then what, you go back to, you go back to the marina, mm -hmm. get back in the boat. Yeah. You see anybody, you talk to anybody out there? Um, talked to a couple guys fishing, and asked me, you know, did you catch anything? And, uh, they didn't either. Um, that part seems to be true. If we're going off of the tonal tell that we can tell, he is projecting it, he's enunciating clearly, he has confidence behind his words, there's no fragility, there's no increased pitch, the tone is rich and confident. I do believe he's telling the truth in this area. Sure enough, also, after I did enough research, I was able to discover that, indeed, people had seen him after the fact. While he was trying to load his boat back up, he had some difficulties, they were all laughing, so on and so forth. And if you think about it, say I'm right. Say that the theory that I have right now, based off of his behavior and the evidence given, say I'm right and he had just dumped his pregnant wife into the bay and then he's acting like nothing happened with these fishermen. It really puts into perspective who Scott is as a person. The guys working, fixing, uh, maintenance guys got a good laugh when he tried that. Back down the trailer. Okay. Um, so a couple guys laughing and a couple guys talking about fishing. Um, then what? How did you get there? Um, you highway, you mean? Yeah. Um, what's it? What's the highway to, uh, Oakland? It's 580. Yeah. And they take 80, 80 north, right? right? To go to, like, go to Sacramento or, um, 
So you took 580, 80? Okay. Yeah. And it's like second exit. And I checked with all that on maps. The route that he's talking about makes sense with the times that he's delivered. It's true. The recollection that he's talking about here is true. That is the route that he took. That is the time that it took. But that's not the question. The question is, what were you perhaps carrying in your truck while you took that route? Come home the same way. Yeah. yeah. Stop for gas. Stop for gas. Then uh, here's the which one's near the off mine? Uh, Little more. Okay. Um, which stop? Uh, I think it's a Chevron station. There is a. Uh, is that on the way home or the way there? Oh, yeah. How'd you pay? It's great, right? Do you have the receipt still? I uh, think you have receipt. Yeah. Okay, when, when you got in the car, when did you call? I called Lacey uh, just as I was leaving the marina. Home town? Where it was. Uh, home in the mobile. Did you, uh, when you left, were you wearing, what, what were you wearing when you left? A uh, jean and t shirt. And what were those shoes? Oh, Timberwolves. Which jacket? Uh, uh, in your jacket and your truck? Well, I left the house. Uh -huh. I didn't have a jacket on. Right. Was in the warehouse. Um, I had that green pullover on. It was in my truck. You saw uh, when it started raining. I had a camo jacket on in the boat and a tan hat. Okay, so then you uh, went back to the shop. You unhooked the boat. Mm -hmm. What happened? What else did you do? Anything else? No, I did. I guess I saw that Max uh, Blake getting home. So. Anybody else in the warehouse area? Uh, anybody? Not this afternoon, there was a pill this morning. Okay, I'm going to stop the interview here for a couple reasons. One, not only because his body language seems to be completely blank throughout the rest of the interrogation, which once again I found to be very frustrating, but because this storyline is one of the biggest areas that I find the most contention with, the one that I have the most issue with. Now let's talk about a little bit about the court hearing itself and how many issues there were within that. For the prosecution, they tried to bring in sniffer dogs. However, the defense quickly pointed out that those specific sniffer dogs that were used were not fully qualified to use their findings as concrete admissible evidence. It could be taken into consideration, but only in light of the rest of the evidence. That was their goal, was not to present Scott as guilt-free, but as not beyond a reasonable doubt found guilty. So they just got it knocked down to where it wasn't concrete. Well then on the defense's side, one of their demonstrations that they did is they, they said that Scott couldn't physically lift and throw 150-ish pounds out of that small of a boat. Now, the courts pushed against that, and there's more issues with that beyond what the prosecution brought up. First, the prosecution brought up that one, not the same boat. It was a different boat. Two, the person who was trying to do the demonstration was working for the defense. So obviously, they're going to push for it to fail. And three, where that person was standing in that boat would never have been where a person would to try to throw something like that. So what the prosecution suggested was that the entire test be run again. But instead of using a different boat, you use the same boat that Scott has. The boat that the defense used, that Scott used for the argument, had a much higher center of gravity. The way it was built, it was more prone to tip. So they suggested, well, why not just use the boat that Scott used? You still have it, why not use it? Along with that, instead of having somebody from the defense try to do the test, which is obviously going to be flawed, why not use somebody who's either impartial or on the side of the prosecution? Because then that would really show that a person could in fact throw 150 pounds out of the boat. Oddly enough, the defense never allowed for that to happen. What a shock. Seems curious to me. That would be a pretty big home run hit for the defense if it did work that way, and despite all of the best efforts, it still failed. That would be great for Scott, but they decided not to do that. 
Also, Scott himself in this interrogation, which it's not on the footage that I presented with you, but it is there, he says and agrees to do a polygraph test. So when he agrees to it here, he knows that if he says no, he can't really have a good reason for that. His goal should be, yes, I want to clear myself for this, but if he says no, then that really doesn't go forward with that. So he says sure here, and then later on, is, like I think it was either the day of or the day before the polygraph, when everything was getting set up, he calls in and says, you know what, scratch that, we're not doing the polygraph, which is a huge suspicious move. Why on earth would you not? Now it is true that polygraphs indeed can come up with false positives. All that a polygraph is measuring is a person's stress around certain questions. It's not really measuring truth, it's measuring stress. So perhaps he was advised to not do that. Not only if he was innocent, that might be a bad idea, but if he was guilty, that would be a terrible idea because there's a lot of stress around that. And this battle went back and forth. Finally, the defense found out that the jurors were not fairly selected. They specifically selected jurors that were all okay with the death sentence and omitted those who weren't. And that is unfair selection of jurors. They can largely oppose it, but when it boils down to it, have to be okay with it. But they selected people that all only supported the death sentence. And that's not fair to the defendant. So here recently, actually earlier this year, due to the flaws in the jury selection, Scott's death sentence has been overruled. He's still facing life in prison, but his death sentence is no longer viable due to that flawed selection. So this wraps up everything for Scott. For me, I am all but certain that he is a murderer. I have no sympathy for the man. If only for the fact that he showed repeatedly through his body language, through his behavior, and through his actions thereafterwards, that he showed no care for his wife and unborn son. And I find that alone to be trash, so I don't have sympathy for him. But with everything else, all of the lies that he told, needless lies, showing that he's a pathological liar, showing that he has a history of being able to cover his own ass from people who might be searching into that side of things. Showing all of this and considering the massive amount of circumstantial evidence that was piled against him, I think that he is indeed guilty. I think that the courts got it correct. But to be very, very fair and to play devil's advocate, there is not concrete evidence. And unfortunately, he could not be proven guilty beyond a shadow of a doubt, though that is how the jurors found him to be. So was he completely guilty? I cannot say. Nobody can say. Nobody can even tell how Lacey was killed. But the alternatives, the defense's alternatives, what Scott and his attorneys presented were so far-reaching and so out there that it seemed more of a fantasy world than the one created by the prosecution. In Scott's defense, there was a break-in on his street, and one of the aspects that his attorney presented was that perhaps the people who were doing the break-in across the street were confronted by Lacey, and then they panicked and took her and had to dispose of her because they accidentally did a kidnapping, which is plausible, but then it does all of this stuff to frame Scott as well, making it seem like he's the one and not them, and they left no trace, but he did, so on and so forth, and that one seems unrealistic. Another one that was suggested is that maybe a homeless person just happened upon her out in the park doing her thing and took her to the bay, which is, needless to say, hours away. The homeless person took a body from a park near their house in Modesto and traveled, I think it's an hour and 45 minutes to the bay where they deposited her and sent her out and then she washed back up, so on and so forth. And actually, it's interesting, the prosecution tried to bring in a hydrologist who was able to kind of map where perhaps the body would have originated and the defense quickly pointed out that that hydrologist was not fully qualified and it was also knocked down to having to be considered in with all the rest of the evidence, circumstantial. That's my opinion of it. I'm sorry that this didn't have as much body language, 
To be very frank, there's not much body language in this interrogation. There's never much body language with Scott Peterson. And that's frustrating as a nonverbal analyst, but it keeps giving me a goal to reach for. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know this is part three, and I know that this was a very long video, but this is my wrapping up of the case of Scott Peterson. Let me know how you felt in the comments below. If you disagree with me, that's totally okay. Since there's not concrete evidence, it's really going to still be up to opinion. I've given you my reasons, I've given you my research, and I've given you the opinion that I have. If you have a different one, let me know in the comments below. It will at least inspire a lot of interesting conversations between everybody. If you would like to see more videos that are centered around true crime or so on and so forth, please let me know who you would like to see in the comments below and consider supporting me through Patreon, Merch, and Audible. Right now, those are my three. If you do that, then that can allow me to get content that has more of a gruesome storyline like this out to you without risk of me losing my job, more or less. Also, if you did like this video specifically, hit the like button if you want to see more, hit subscribe, hit the bell if you want to see them sooner. And like I said before, always feel free to let me know your suggestions in the comments because eventually I'll run a poll for the most popular suggestion and I'll do that person. I'm always happy to do a nonverbal read for you. It's just a matter of who it is. But, but, without further ado, that's all that I've got for the day. My name is Logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.